Hello, and welcome to our second webinar in a series of two, The Complex Web of Leaves of Absence 2. My name is Julie Dorr, and I'll be your moderator for today's event. Our presentation will last approximately 40 minutes with the remaining time available for your questions. Remember that you can enter your questions at any time. And here I've just put my phone number up there just in case you need me or my email address. Um, but remember that you can enter your questions anytime in the questions section of your dashboard. And once we get through all the content today, because there's quite a bit, we'll answer those questions at the end of the presentation. So um, I highly recommend you get your questions in so that we can, those could be the first ones we answer. Also, we provided you with a copy of our presentation in the handout section. If you have any problems downloading it, feel free to email me right now at julie4group.com. Dot com, and I'll send you that document right away. We've changed up the way we deliver that handout. So it's available again on your dashboard. Just download it, or if you're having problems with that, email me. Before we get started, please note that this webinar and all the accompanying materials are protected by copyright and that the entire conference is being recorded. This presentation provides general information only and does not constitute legal, legal advice. We recommend that you consult with your legal counsel to address your specific situation. So let's get started today by welcoming our expert panel. First, we have attorney Marla Mara Robinson, followed with the law firm Mara Robinson Jackson and Clarkson. She's a partner and head of the firm's transactional department. She primarily practices in the areas of corporate, mergers and acquisitions, real estate, finance, and employment law. And then, of course, we have Linda Duffy, president of ESO Team and Capital Solutions. Linda works with business owners and executives to provide strategic human resources direction, develop leadership talent, and increase organizational effectiveness. And Linda, most recently, you just completed your accreditation in teamwork. For Wiley, what was that about? Can you share a little bit real quickly before I get started? Uh, sure. Thanks for catching me off guard with that question, Julie. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, absolutely. I uh, took some advanced training uh, a little while ago, actually, on the five behaviors of a cohesive team. So it's been really exciting. I've been doing some work with some executive teams and helping them uh, function a little bit better and help them start by building some trust and take them through a process so they can focus on collective results. So we're seeing some really good response with the teams we're working with, and I'm really excited to continue that kind of work. Well, great, great. All right, well, let's get started then. Linda, you're gonna kick us off. I am, thanks so much, Julie. Hi everybody, uh, thanks for joining us again on uh, the part two of our Leaves of Absence webinar. Um, I put up this slide because I love to just remind everybody how many leads we actually have in the state of California. So, of course, we have to deal with any federal laws um, that dictate leads, such as FMLA, but we also have so many times uh, California laws that are either uh, sort of a mirror image of the federal law with some changes just to make your life interesting or our own set of leave laws. So we're going to be talking about those today. So we previously, in our last month's webinar, covered FMLA, CFRA, pregnancy, FEHA, and workers' comp. So really, the bulk of the time off uh, due to a medical condition leaves. If you missed that webinar, since we're not going to really be focused on that today, um, we encourage you to go out to the YouTube channel and watch that so you can get caught up. Um, it's just a great reference tool. And of course, you can always reach out to me or Mar Marla if you have any questions about anything. Um, today's agenda um, is just, first I'm just going to give you a quick update on the uh, some changes to pregnancy, disability leave. We're going to talk about another 17 leaves that we have besides the ones I just mentioned to you, and then of course we'll take uh, questions and answers from you. So there are a couple of changes in law that go into effect April 1st of this year. And one of them that affects leaves of absence has to do with changes to the pregnancy disability leave law. So I highlighted here just some of the main changes just to bring your attention to them. So first of all, uh, the law was changed. This is where FIHA were talking about pregnancy disability leave. Uh, employees are titled up to four months per pregnancy, not per year. So a lot of questions used to arise about that. Well, what happens if a woman gets pregnant? You know, she has a baby in January um, and takes some time off for that and then turns around later in the year and has another pregnancy. So she would be entitled to four months, up to four months while she's disabled due to pregnancy. 
Um, there's also a specific protection now for transgender persons who are disabled by pregnancy. And I'm sorry, I can't help you there on exactly how that works logistically, but they are disabled by pregnancy, then they also have pregnancy disability protections. Um, the main one is that there is a new posting and notice requirement that's effective April 1st. So I gave you some links here for the new posting notice that has to go into effect. If you already have bought your posters for the year uh, with like the change to, for example, minimum wage, something like that, you can just download this and then mark through the other one and post this next to it. But I know if you go out to Cal Chamber or any of those other services and buy the posters, um, they will have the updated language. Uh, the law also is very specific to say that you have to leave the current posters up until March 31st and then put these up immediately on April 1st. So I'm just passing that note along. Uh, the new pregnancy disability leave notice also must be translated, and this is true for just about every you know document California wants you to give out to employees. But if you have um, part of your workforce that has um, at least 10% of your workforce is speaking a language other than English, it must be translated into that language. This does replace notice A and B. So the good news is they're trying to cut down on the number of notices you have to give employees. So right now there's a notice A and a notice B depending on how many employees you have. So this particular notice that you're going to give employees, try to put all the information into one. But if you do have more than 50 employees, it's recommended that you also post a secondary um, notice or provide that to the employees. So I gave you that link as well. Okay, with that, I am going to turn it over to Marla, and she's going to take you through a whole bunch of leads, and then I'll be back in a few minutes to talk about a few more. Thank you, Linda. Um, as you'll see, we're going to go through, at, from Linda's list, that one slide with so many of them, many, many leaves. My cautionary um, comment to everyone is check the rules every time one of these leaves comes up, because like those leaves we discussed in part one that are very, very complex, these leaves are not as complex, but they don't come up as often. So the rules are not um, as quick to come to memory, um, even for me. I don't, I don't deal with these leaves. I will, t I will point out to the ones that I do often with clients. So I'm always pulling the rules to make sure that I'm, I'm giving the correct advice. So the first one we're going to discuss is U.S. military leave laws. And the primary law is the Uniform Services Employment and Reemployment Rights Act. It, it, it applies to all employers, and the eligibility is for all employees who enlist in military service or who perform military duties or reserve duties. The qualifying events is the enlistment or call to perform military duties. The, the, the leave is unpaid, but the length of time is time needed up to a maximum of five years. Reinstatement is guaranteed unless the business circumstances change, which would make it unreasonable or impossible. And of course, it's the employer's burden to show that it was unreasonable or impossible. And when they reinstate, they have the same rights as if they had remained continuously employed. Advance notice is required when possible. Of course, sometimes it's not possible. When someone returns, you can't terminate them except for cause for a certain period of time, and that period of time depends on length of the service that they were out um, on leave and deployed. So we, you have to look at what that is to know what the period of time is. So that, that's a unique um, to me and with respect to all the leaves on termination, you've got to California, of course, likes to mirror and then add to the federal protections. So we have California military leave law that can be found in the California Military and Veterans Code, sections 394 through 395, which prohibit discrimination against any officer, warrant officer, or enlisted member of the military or naval forces. The eligibility standards are employees who are members of a reserve corps or who have other specified military obligations. That includes those who serve in the Army, the Navy, the Marine Corps, Air Force, Coast Guard, Reserves, Army or Air National Guard, and Commissioned Corps of the Public Health Service. The length of leave, again, is unpaid, but 17 days to private employers and 180 days for public employers. Uh, the reinstatement rights are guaranteed. Um, advance notice is implied. It, again, very much mirrors the, the federal. The unique thing here about the California military leave law 
is not only does it make it unlawful, it makes it a misdemeanor to discriminate because of military status. And of course, that brings in the criminal element. So criminal is always, even though it's a misdemeanor, it's still criminal as opposed to a civil. The um, change for this year is Cal California has always had that members of the California National Guard, not always, excuse me, but prior to this year, the members of the California National Guard who were called to active duty were are entitled to unlimited paid leave and reinstatement to their former position or sim, a position of similar seniority, pay and status. Well, now members of other states' National Guards are as well. And we have spousal military leave also under the California Military and Veterans Code. For those of you who are, who are, who are code section junkies, it's 395.10. I'm one of those people who likes to read the code. <laughs> the employer coverage is 25 or more employees. Um, it, the eligibility is employees who are spouses of armed forces, National Guard, or reserves. But you must be, um, meet the qualified employee must meet four criteria. It must be the spouse of the qualified person. They must work 20 or more hours per week. You must notify the employer within 25 days of receiving official notice that the qualified individual will be on leave from deployment or the intention to take leave. So that's the, where you see the advance notice requirements below. And that's official notice from whoever is um, telling the qualified individual. And then you must submit written documentation certifying that his or her spouse will be on leave. The length of leave is 10 days and the reinstatement rights are, are absolute. We have the Civil Air Patrol Employment Act, Protection Act. This is found in the Labor Code sections 1500 through 1507. It applies to all employers with 16 or more employees. To be eligible, the employees must be volunteer members of the California Wing of the Civil Air Patrol. By the way, I've never had most of these um, these requests, and this is one never ever have had come up. But I'm sure there are those of you who have employees who might be members of the California Wing of the Civil Air Patrol. You have to be employed for at least 90 day period um, immediately preceding the request for the leave, or the, excuse me, the commencement of the leave. And they must be to qualify directed by the political entity to respond to an emergency operational mission. As you'll see with many of these leaves, emergency situations get heightened protections. The length of the leave is 10 days unpaid and the reinstatement rights are guaranteed to the same or equivalent position. Again, as much notice as possible, but because this is really in the emergency situation, uh, you might not have much notice. And of course, the same sections prohibit discrimination and retaliation. So our next one, uh, next leave is for voluntary firefighters, reserve peace officers, and emergency rescue personnel. And this is designed to encourage civil service. Um, and because it, even though it says here, voluntary firefighters, reserve peace officers, and emergency rescue personnel, it's actually all other emergency personnel, any emergency personnel. Employers are prohibited, prohibited under the California Labor Code sections 230.3 and 230.4 from discharging or discriminating against such employees for taking time off to perform emergency duties. And of course, this, again, is to encourage this, this service and to properly respond to um, emergencies. Employers with 50 or, this is all employers, employers with 50 or more employees have additional obligations. They must provide leaves not to exceed 14 days for the purpose of um, engaging in training. The qualifying events are listed here, and again, the leave here is 14 days. The next leave we have is crime victims, and this is actually found under two different sections of the Labor Code, um, and are, they're slightly different. There's section 230.2 and section 230.5, and this, uh, these apply to all employers. Section 230.2 is when an employee is requested to come to court by court of officers, by subpoena, court order, um, through either attorneys who are considered court officers or the court itself. And section 230.5 is for when the employee might have a family member um, that they want to attend on, on their behalf, although they have not been subpoenaed to do so, they want to 
what's more voluntary. Um, a victim under 230.2 means certain felonies, such as violent or serious felonies, or a felony involving theft or embezzlement. Those are defined in the penal code if you're a code junkie again. The employee can use accrued vacation, personal leave, sick leave, comp time, or any other unpaid, time leave, unpaid leave time that the employer has. And to the extent that the employer can, they must keep the employee's absence confidential. And the employer cannot discharge, discriminate against, or retaliate against the employee for these leaves. The advance notice is when feasible. Um, certainly if it's under 230.2, there's going to be the subpoena or the court order, and there's generally notice there, so although sometimes that notice can be very, very short. In the similar area of the Labor Code Section 230C and D and 230.1 is the Victims of Domestic Violence. And that prohibits discrimination or dis discharging an employee who is a victim of domestic violence from taking time from work to appear in court due to subpoena, which again is when the, the courts are asking or demanding you to come, or to obtain seek judicial relief, like a temporary restraining order, that's when you go on your own to help ensure the health and safety and welfare of the employee or a child. Also for medical treatment, if the employee is a victim of domestic violence and needs to take time off work for medical treatment. It's for all employers and then employers with 25 or more have additional requirements that prohibit action just for taking time off to seek the medical attention but also for psychological counseling or to obtain resources from a domestic violence program. Um, the employer again must keep must take uh, reasonable steps to keep the absence confidential, and the employee may use vacation, personal leave, or comp time during the absence, unless you're in a union and you have a collective bargaining agreement that says otherwise. We don't really um, speak to unions in our webinars, but that's just a uh, carve out I'll give you here. An advance notice, again, is where feasible. You know, if it's under subpoena, you're going to have some period of time. If it's a temporary restraining order you might, that somebody's going in to seek, you might not have that. And of course, reinstatement rights are there. Very similarly, we have the leave protections for victims of sexual assault, which can be found in the same labor code section 230. And it covers all employers with some additional obligations for employers of 25 or more. Generally, they are the same rules as those for victims of domestic violence. The length of leave is the time necessary to resolve the issues. Our next leave is victims of stalking. It's very similar, again, to the same as victims of domestic violence. Uh, the time necessary to resolve the issues is the length of leave, and the reinstatement rights are there. Advance notice where possible. And then the next leave we have that I see the most often is the California Drug uh, um, Alcohol Rehabilitation Act. Actually, it goes the other way, Alcohol and Drug Rehabilitation Act. This can be found in uh, California Labor Code sections 1025 and 1028. And it's uh, a, a difficult section if you read the sections because it requires private employers with 25 employees or more to reasonably accommodate, we know what happens when we use those words, um, employees uh, who request uh, assistance with rehabilitation. So the question becomes, what is reasonable? Is it a period of time off? Uh, is it something else? So we need to look at what the reasonability standard. Um, current illegal drug or alcohol use is not protected under the ADA, the federal ADA, EHA, um, where the person is an employee who, it, in, at least with my clients, um, is caught using drugs at work or test positive for drugs at work, um, you can immediately terminate. It's, this statute comes down really more to a matter of timing. If the employee comes to you before you've discovered an alcohol or drug problem and says, I need an accommodation to attend rehabilitation um, or, to, or to obtain treatment, that's when you need to find you need to make the determination of whether it's reasonable. Now, I recommend with my clients that they go through the same interactive process that we go through with disabilities under um, FEHA and make the determination of what we can do to uh, reasonably accommodate. The employee can use sick leave if, if there's sick leave available and you should 
always contact your council to look at the interplay, whether FMLA, CFRA, or FEHA is going to apply as well. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Linda. Thanks so much, Marla. Um, sorry about the slides there, everybody. As soon as I try to uh, look at something that's uh, in that, whatever you call it, on the dashboard on the right, so it looked like somebody had their hand raised, I want to see if there was a problem. And as soon as I do that, of course, I mess up the slides. So my apologies for that. Um, thanks so much, Marla. And like Marla said, a lot of these leads were telling you that they exist because by law you're required to provide them. But a lot of these are not something that we have come up on a regular basis. So like Marla just said, um, the California Alcohol and Drug Rehab Act <clears throat> law, I do have come up on occasion. Um, and the thing to remember on that one, as Marla was pointing out, is that you know you could have somebody that comes forward, says, hey, I've got a problem and I need accommodation. They may or may not uh, qualify for FMLA or CFRA or any other leave, but they may qualify for this one. If they do qualify for everything, you want to run them concurrently. So if somebody comes forward and they, they, you have 50 more employees at your company and they say we need to go into rehab, you can also potentially run that concurrently with FMLA and CFRA. So um, just make sure you want to look at all the leaves that apply. Um, and trigger your clock starting on those other leaves if you can, although there's no time limit on that particular one. Um, okay, so the first of them I'm gonna talk about, there's actually two of them combined here, and that's organ and bone marrow donation. These are a little bit different from a lot of the leaves <clears throat> because these leaves are actually potentially paid leaves. So if you have 15 or more employees, you are required to give um, employees time off if they want to donate an organ or bone marrow. So it's 30 days per year if they're an organ donor and five days for bone marrow um, donation. Um, the employee is protected in terms of their job, they have reinstatement rights, and of course they have to give you advance notice on this one. Um, you can request that they provide you some sort of written verification that they're a donor and then it's a medical necessity to make the donation if you want. Um, and leaves may be taken in one or more periods within the year. So the leave cannot be considered a break in service for, you know, uh, vacation accrual, seniority, that type of thing. Um, and it, you cannot use the time off to count against any FMLA or CFRA accrual. So this, these two leaves in particular, we sort of combine them here, but these two leaves have some very different rules. So you can require an employee to take um, up to two weeks of earned sick or vacation leave for organ donation. Um, but as it says here, they can take up to 30 days. If they don't have the time available, then as a company you are required to pay them for their time off. Um, you can also require them to take five days off if they're donating bone marrow. So again, this one has some unusual requirements in it that we don't see in most of these leaves. Um, so you want to make sure if anybody comes forward and says, hey, this is what I need to do, that you uh, take a look at the legal requirements um, in great detail on that one. Sick leave, we've been talking about, you know, it seems like forever now for the last year. Uh, so just a recap on the sick leave. Everybody knows that this went into effect last July. The requirement is for all employers and any employee who is going to work at least 30 days within a year for the same employer is entitled to leave and they can start using it um, on their 90th day of employment. So the quality, qualifying events are all listed here. So this is for preventative care, diagnosis, or care and treatment. So potentially someone could come to you and say, I need to take sick leave because I want to go get a flu shot, which would be preventative. So <clears throat> um, this is you know, one of those day-to-day -day leaves. They call it a leave, but day-to-day -day benefits that we see used all the time. Um, the length of leave available is really up to your company policy, but the minimum is 24 hours or three days, whichever is greater. Um, and again, the law says that you can't count that absence you know, in terms of disciplinary action. Um, so it's a little bit different from other things as well. Okay, time off to vote. Marla and I were talking with Julie before um, we started the webinar, and I said, you know, in 30 years of being in HR, never once has this come up, and Marla said for her it's come up once. So here's what the requirement is. It applies to all employers in the state. If you have an employee that 
is unable to vote due to their work schedule. So think about this for California. Polls open at 7 a.m., close at 8 p.m. It would be highly unusual, in my opinion, that somebody would not be able to get to a polling place during that 13 hours. But potentially, maybe somebody has a long commute and they're scheduled for 12 hours. Maybe if they work in certain industries, maybe they're working more than 12 hours. Um, so you just want to be aware, for most of us that are in corporate America, this is never going to apply. But if you have an employee say, hey, you know what, I want to take a time off to go vote on the election day, this time must be paid. Okay, so if they need four hours off, you only have to pay two, but if they need two hours off because you've got them scheduled across um, those 13 hours, then you would have to pay that time off as well. There's also with this one, remember, a posting requirement, so you must post a notice regarding that ability to take time off at least 10 days before the election, and then you have to leave that up uh, until the day of the election, so keep that posting requirement um, in mind as well as we start getting closer to election days. Jury duty, this is clearly one that does come up frequently. Uh, this is captioned in, in the Labor Code Section 230, uh, Section A. It does not need to be paid, um, and there's actually no direction on the use or requirement to use PTO, meaning vacation, sick, paid time off, whatever, so don't require them to use it would be our advice. Um, also keep in mind with jury duty that there's a difference between how you're going to treat your exempt employees and your non-exempt employees. So non-exempt employees, most likely you're paying hourly. If they go to jury duty, you know, they get their five bucks from the court or whatever it is. If you want to allow them to take paid time off benefits, that's great. Otherwise, you don't, there's no requirement to pay it. Um, and, you know, if they're gone for the day, you don't pay them, right? But an exempt employee, remember, is going to be a little bit different because if they're doing any work, if they're checking their messages while, you know, on break at the courthouse, if they're returning phone calls, if they're doing anything, you're going to want to pay them for that full week. So just keep that in mind that there is going to be a difference in how you treat your exempt and your non-exempt employees. Um, they could potentially be gone on, um, you know, a trial for a really long time. I don't know about anybody else, but I've been watching the O.J. Simpson thing that's been on TV, and, you know, that they were the jurors. The jurors were complaining this last sort of episode because it had been 18 months. <laughs> you know, so it's sort of crazy how long some trials uh, can last. Okay, witness duty. <clears throat> this is in California Labor Code Section 230, Subpart B. You cannot discharge, discriminate against, or retaliate against um, someone who needs to appear as a witness. So if they bring you a subpoena, they say, I've been subpoenaed to appear as a witness at trial or deposition or whatever it is. Um, for that period of time, they must appear. Uh, they have basically job protection, and you must put them back into that uh, position. They should be giving you ad advance notice. Shouldn't walk in that day, obviously, because they're going to get the subpoena ahead of time. Uh, but just remember you're not going to discharge or discriminate against or retaliate against them for taking advantage of this type of leave. It does not need to be paid by the company. And again, there's no direction in the law on the use of PTO. So if you want to allow them uh, to use their time off benefits, then do so, but be careful about requiring them to do so. Okay, next we have time off to visit school authorities. If you were with us in our January webinar on new laws in the new year, then you already know that, that there have been some sections of the code that have been slightly changed. So California Labor Code section 230.7 talks about this. And in this particular leave, what we're talking about is time off if, if your kid gets in trouble at school, basically. That's how it's always been used. So you get a call, hey, Johnny's in the principal's office, come on down. The, as an employer, you are required to give them the time off to go deal with that. That's now been expanded to also give in, um, employees time off for finding childcare and enrolling children in childcare or school, and then also for childcare emergencies. Okay, so that got extended beyond what it was before when it was just looking like a suspension or expulsion from school. 
the Family School Partnership Act um, sort of goes hand in hand with this, but it's used for different, different reasons, and this is Section 230.8. So if you have 25 employees or more at the same location, you must give time off so your employee can participate in some sort of activity at school. So it could be, you know, to go to a soccer game or go see a play, you know, that your kid's in or something like that. Um, so this is for employees with children or custody of children that anywhere from daycare on up through you know, grades one through 12 or if they're even in a licensed childcare facility. So all of that got expanded. This is up to eight hours per month of leave that they can take and 40 hours per year. Um, now the good news on this one is that you can require them to use their vacation or PTO time. Um, so if you want to write that into your policy, feel free to do so. But you also want to remember that you're not going to discriminate against them in any way or, or retaliate in any way because um, there's actually some pretty strong penalties built into this one and it can be up to three times lost wages um, if you take any action against the employee for exercising their rights under this particular law. Okay, <clears throat> the next one is the Employee Literacy Education Assistance Act. And again, I have never seen this um, come up in all of my years. Uh, for employers that have 25 or more employees, uh, if an employee comes to you and says, I want to enroll in this adult literacy education assistance program, you know, it could be I want to learn, you know, English better or I need help reading or whatever it is. If they're going to enroll and participate, participate in the program, then you must reasonably accommodate uh, their request for time off. So it could be just providing them with some information. Um, you don't have to pay it again, uh, but you do need to provide them the time off and you must keep the fact that they are illiterate confidential. So again, note, <clears throat> you certainly are not going to terminate the employee for illiteracy, uh, but if somebody comes to you and says, hey, why is Sally not here? You don't want to go out and say, oh, because she's becoming literate, okay? All right, there's a few other leads just to talk about, just to get you to think about, um, and that is leads that are not right now statutorily mandated. Uh, for example, one that comes up all the time is bereavement leave. So just some questions to think about, you know, um, does your company have a policy for bereavement? Who's going to qualify for the leave? Is it all employees? Do they have to um, have been with the company a certain period of time? Is it only certain um, types of employees? Again, you don't want to make those determinations based on a protected class, but are you going to say, you know, uh, managers and above get this leave or everybody in the company? Whose deaths are covered? Um, that's you know, hard to sort of say in those times, oh, I'm sorry, you know, we don't count ants as important or something like that. But ahead of time is who's going to be covered? Is it aunts and uncles and cousins and nephews and nieces? Is it just immediate family? How much time off are you going to give them and whether it's going to be paid or unpaid? Um, I've got clients that say, you know, you, you're welcome to use any accrued time off benefit that you have. And I have others that actually provide a paid uh, bereavement leave because, again, in theory, this doesn't happen too often. Um, and then the tricky one on this one is always, you know, is proof of death required? Are you going to require someone to bring you something, an obituary? Um, you know, you're going to attend a service and you want someone to bring you um, the program back or something like that. I don't, I have not had that request made a lot. It's certainly, you could make the request, but you want to be sensitive, obviously, under those circumstances. Another leave that does come up all the time is a personal leave. So what I mean by personal leave, or you could also say a personal medical leave, is let's say you're at a company and the company is under the requirements for FMLA and CFRA, but as you all know, the, em the employee also has eligibility requirements of being there at least a year and working um, a certain number of hours. But let's say somebody's been with you for you know, a few months 60 days, 90 days, 120 days, they're not yet qualified for FMLA or CFRA, and they come to you and they say, I've got this issue, right? Um, maybe it's medical, maybe it's not. Maybe they come to you and they say, you know what, my mother lives overseas and I want to take basically an extended period of time to go see her. Um, will you 
you know, grant that request or not. So under what circumstances can an employee take a personal leave or a personal medical leave? Sometimes we usually break those out separately in our handbooks, but however you want to do it. But for how long are you going to allow them to take that leave? You know, are you going to guarantee their job? Are you going to have it affect benefits in any way? You can pretty much do, I don't want to say anything you want to do there, but you can pretty much do whatever you want to because you're not required by law to actually grant that leave. Now, Marla is going to say, wait a second, Linda. <laughs> um, you may have a requirement because it may be considered reasonable accommodation. You may have to go through that. But just in general, you can put whatever rules around you want that you want to because there is no requirement to offer that on the surface anyway. Okay, let's see. <clears throat> the computer is a little bit slow here. Last slide that we want to talk about before we take your questions, and again, as Julie pointed out before, you can just write those, type those questions in over on the dashboard on the right. Um, all of these leaves that we're talking about here that are statutorily mandated, Marla and I both said it over and over again, you want to make sure that uh, you are not discriminating against, discharging, or retaliating against any employees who ask about the leave or actually take the leave. Um, there are some pretty severe penalties, and they differ by leave, so we're just grouping it all here together to say, you know, it could be reimbursement for lost wages and benefits. It could be, um, you know, that you're forced to put that employee back into the same or similar position. And there's always, of course, administrative remedies and potentially civil actions. So you want to make sure that you're clear on what the requirements are on the leave and that you're granting the leaves appropriately um, as you're required to do so. And with that, Julie, I'm going to turn it back over to you for our questions and answers. Well, great. Thank you so much, Linda and Marla. As always, my head's spinning with all the other leaves of absence that uh, we all have to deal with. Um, I want to take some time right now and go through exactly how we can kick off this question and answers with both Linda and Marla. If you recall, we mentioned that you can enter your questions in your dashboard. There's a section that actually says questions at the bottom. Just type your question in and send it, and I will read them aloud for both Marla and Linda to answer. Um, and if you prefer, some of you have sent me email questions, so feel free to do that. My email address is julie at the door group and door is spelled D-O-R-R. -R. So let's get started first. I think it's just a clarification we need to have, Miss um, Marla. Um, Cindy's wondering, she said she thought you, she heard you say um, California military leave is paid. Can you just go through quickly what you actually meant with that? Because I, I don't think all of California military leave is paid. So yeah, I, I heard the same that? thing. I I think, yeah, I think Marla misspoke on that when I heard the same thing. Okay. I, I think everybody miss, I misspoke or you misheard me. There is one California military leave that is paid, um, and that, but it's very, very narrow, and that's for members of the California National Guard who are ordered into active state service for emergency purposes. That is, um, and, you know, the, the, um, statute unfortunately does not state how long that can be but again it's emergency purposes and, and the, the uh, new portion of the statute that came into effect this year for uh, members of the National Guard in other states so for example if you have an employee here but they're a member of the National Guard in Arizona and there's an emergency and they get called up that applies to them as well so very very limited um, application there for paid everything else is unpaid. So I'm sorry I've, I've confused everyone. But before we go to the next question, um, Julie, I just wanted to yeah. um, point out after Linda's presentation, with respect to all of these, I would encourage everyone to look at them from a reasonable accommodation standpoint. Linda kind of alluded to this and she's, when she said, I think Marla's going to say use reasonable accommodation. I would, with respect to all of them always because you're going to be looked at everything you do is going to be looked at from a fairness standard by a judge or a jury if a claim is brought and that reasonable accommodation analysis will get you to that fairness standard so i think it's a good rule of thumb while it may not be required by law um, as a, a proactive against liability and claims to use a reasonable accommodation standard Okay, great. Thank you. I missed your note. Marla, sorry about that. 
Um, that's good. So now moving on here real quickly, we're also, we got another question from Cindy. So the time necessary to resolve issues includes the time for the victim to get back to normal. So I think that was for Linda. I think you were covering the- That was um, Marla. Oh, Marla, sorry. Marla, I think you were co you were covering, um, I would guess it is the, and I'm just clicking here, victims of stalking or maybe victims of sexual assault or domestic violence. So in, in essence, yes. the time that it takes for them to totally heal and get back to normal is what's covered? Not necessarily for everybody. Um, so there's the victims of domestic violence, the victims of sexual assault, the victims of stalking, and basically the rules are the same. If you have less than 25 employees, you're only required to give them the time off to, to appear in court due to subpoena or uh, on their own to obtain ju um, judicial relief for a temporary restraining order. And, you know, Linda and I have, have been talking throughout this presentation of those things that we see a lot of and those things we don't see anything of. We do see a lot of this, unfortunately. Um, if you have under 25 employees, that's the only time you're required to give them time off. If you have 25 or more employees, then you're also required to give them time off to seek medical attention, um, psychological counseling, uh, to go to a domestic violence program to obtain other resources, and maybe the same for their children. Um, so again, though, if even though you might not have 25 employees, you might consider looking at that as a reasonable accommodation. It's unpaid time. Um, it, you, might look at it from a morale issue. Is, is this, you know, something we should do to assist our employees so that we show we're supportive of our employees and, you know, what clearly is not the employee's problem. I mean, um, clearly it's not the result of something the employee did, it's somebody, something somebody else did. So uh, the time off to get well, if you will, is the way the question was presented, would fall really in only under those with 25 or more employees. Okay. Linda, did you want to add anything? Nope. Okay, good. Um, Liz has a question about employers paying overtime for jury duty. Um, based on, I think, something Linda has said, do they, if they're doing their full eight hours, if you will, uh, of jury duty, and then end up answering questions or doing some work, do, does the employer have to pay for overtime? And also, can they deduct the court pay? Um, let's take the second one first. I do believe you can deduct the court pay still, but it's like five bucks, so I don't think you probably really want to do that. Um, but that's, again, up to you. The first one, absolutely not. You don't have to pay overtime for that. That is not time worked, um, so you do not have to pay overtime for that. So somebody could potentially sit through however many hours of jury duty service during the day and then come to work in the evening or however that schedule works out, and you're only going to need to pay them for the hours they actually work. Now, if it's an what if it's in a non-exempt employee who is <clears throat> doing work, um, you know, while they're in the courthouse, maybe on breaks or something like that, that you're going to want to capture that time and pay for that time if they're actually doing your work while they're there. So, you know, you get called to jury duty and you're going to sit in the bullpen area until your group gets called. They could potentially sit there and do some work. So if they do, you want to make sure you're paying them for that time, but otherwise, no. Okay, good. Marla, did you want to add anything? I would just add that um, don't do anything that makes the, gives the appearance that you are somehow prohibiting the employee from this jury duty. I mean, you know, many employees don't want to, to serve on jury duty, and if the employer makes it difficult for them, um, it, it can become the employer's problem because it, it, it's illegal to not show up and serve on jury duty. Okay, good. Good. Um, Renee has a question here. Do you recommend creating policies for all these different types of leaves and paternity leave and elder care leave, or do you handle case by case using the overall laws as an umbrella? Can I ask that? Yeah, go for it. <laughs> um, we'll see I if we agree or not. <laughs> yeah, yeah, this will be interesting to see. I recommend that you include in your handbook um, a policy on every one of the leaves that applies to you 
but put in the basics and, and not the, the necessarily the detail. And the reason for that is so it works as an, a tool for both the person who's in, uh, responsible for enforcing policies, which might be the HR director, might be the owner, might be the CFO, depending on the size of the company, and for the employees to know what's there and what's not there. And then when it might become applicable, that's when you dive in and look, okay, is this person eligible? For example, of FMLA, which we talked about in our last webinar, you know, do they have the eligible hours? Even though we are an employer with 50 or more employees, so we have to um, make it known that they, they could be eligible. Are they eligible? Do, do they fall into that? And look at everyone on a case-by-case -case basis. Again, I'll repeat what I said at the beginning. I pull the rules every time because I want to remind myself every single time. I don't deal with victims of, of domestic violence every day. Um, I do get wage and hour claims every day and exempt enough versus non-exempt claims every day. So I don't ever have to pull those rules. <laughs> but yeah. victims of domestic violence, I don't. So I always want to go back and look and see if it, the rules have changed too. Do I have to give, do I have to let them use their sick leave or paid time off? Um, do they get to choose or do I get to choose? Can I force them to take their sick leave and paid time off? So that's my preference. Linda, what, what about you? Yeah, I actually agree with you on this one. So when we draft a handbook for somebody, we go through all of the leaves. We have, you know, we have already written out policies for all of these different leaves. And then we basically go through and remove anything that doesn't apply to you. Um, you know, I come from a very practical standpoint. So my question is, if you're going to have a handbook, you're using that as a reference guide for, for the company, but also for the employees. Hopefully, it's going to answer their questions and eliminate the need to run to HR or the business owner, whoever um, is running, you know, running that part of it. So I think it can cut down on some questions, but I do think it's important that you, I don't want to say stay vague about it, but I would put some general caveats at the beginning that each leave um, is, you know, has different rules regarding, you know, the amount of time you can take off, whether or not the benefits have to be um, continued, whether there's reinstatement, all of those different things. And to, you know, to, to ask the company once that leave, um, you know, becomes necessary or something like that. So we don't go through every single leave and for every single one say, oh, for this leave, you must use your time off and you do get job reinstatement or, you know, whatever. We don't go to that level of detail, but we do say this leave is available. Got it. Okay, good. That's a good advice. Um, um, Mike has a question about just general leave period times. And his question is for the bone marrow, as an example, in leave time, does the leave period need to occur in the same calendar year? Um, I don't know the answer to that question, honestly, off the top of my head. Um, I was going to look at the notes that I have on that right now real quickly, but I okay. don't know. Um, How about we want to bump to another one real quick, and then uh, we can answer another question while you're doing this research? Yeah, I mean, you would have to, I can tell you the, you know, the California uh, Labor Code sections is 1508 through 1513. Um, let me just look at my notes real quickly if I have that. Um, the only thing I have in my notes, Mike, is it says the leave may be taken in one or more periods within the year. Um, but I don't see anything about whether it has to be in the same year. I don't know why that would be a requirement. Um, I can address this if you want. Yeah, please. It's, it's a little bit like FMLA. It says they, they must get up to 30 business days in any one year period, and then one year period is defined as 12 consecutive months, then the employer oh. can define that 12 consecutive months. Is that January through December, or is that February through um, February? You know, so it's, it's, the, it's the 12 consecutive months you have to look at. Okay, good. So Thank if you're you. using a calendar year, they could potentially then have 60, like back to back is what you're saying, Marla. They could take basically December and then the following January for using a calendar year. Yes, but I don't know if like FMLA, you can pick your year. Um, I have to pull the code, but I yeah. know that it's 12 consecutive months to define what those 12 consecutive months are. Right. I don't know, under, under the bone marrow, we'd have to look at the code. Yeah, because and like going like what you just said for FMLA, I would suggest you use a rolling twelve month period. So um, then you could prohibit a little bit of yeah. you know piggybacking. 
All right, good, thank you. Um, do you have a question? Does the time off for crime victims, domestic violence, violence run concurrent with FMLA or is it time to get well? So the, the time off for these crime victims and the domestic violence that we're talking about, does that run concurrent with FMLA? Well, we have to assume that there is going to be, let's assume that there is going to be FMLA because they qualify under the definition of you know, the medical conditions taking care of themselves. Um, the FMLA would start to run on its own. So yes, it would be concurrent. It may be, it may be longer, but it, but it, it may be concurrent during part of it. It may start before the, the FMLA kicks in because of the notice period and when it starts, but yes. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, Kristen has a question too on jury duty follow-up question, and this is for non-exempt employees. Their company pays five days for jury duty. Do they have to pay extra for any time that the employee is doing work while serving jury duty? So let me make sure I understand the question, Kristen. So you're saying if we pay if we pay five, I mean if we pay five days of jury duty, and then the employee comes back at night or something like that. I don't know if that's what you're asking. Um, I think if you're paying, you know, your 40 hours of jury duty and the employee is working, you know, like on a break or something, again, assuming they're taking a 30 minute or hour lunch or whatever it is. Um, but if they're like sitting in the jury room working, you wouldn't have to double dip and pay them twice. So I'm assuming you're asking like if they come back at night then I would say yes, now you're back into that situation where you may have to pay them um, overtime if you're paying them uh, you know for eight hours during the day and then they come back and they do work at night you may actually you're going to pay them for that but you're going to end up in an overtime situation okay. so, thank Julie you. let me Julie yeah. if we can jump back for our just our final thought because I know we're running out of time here I just wanted to let whoever asked about the bone marrow the 12 consecutive months the employer does not have a choice it it the one year period is measured from the date the employee's leave begins, and then that's the 12 consecutive months. Okay, all right, good. In case anybody wants to look it up, it's Labor Code Section 1510. Okay, and Mike, if you have any questions about that, by all means, uh, email either Linda, well, actually probably in this case, Marla would be a good resource, and her email is right on the screen right now. Um, one last question here that just has to do with handbooks, and thinking that might be a good topic for a future webinar, and. Kelly's wondering, um, do you recommend having separate handbooks for different locations? For example, she has employees in California, yeah. Florida, Illinois. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yes, no, I'm just guess. having this, yeah, I'm laughing because it's like the never ending debate. Um, just had this conversation yesterday. You know, and Marla should weigh in on this too. I mean, we have some clients that have employees in different states. And I just said this to a new client yesterday in my first meeting with them is they've got an employee in Oregon, they've got an employee in Louisiana, they've got employees in California. And I said, well, one of the things you're gonna have to give some thought to is, you know, there's different ways to do it. Are you gonna play by those state laws? Meaning you're just gonna go to the highest standard, right? whatever that is, and it's normally California, but not always. Um, and so for example, California has a daily overtime provision. Are you going to therefore pay people in other states a daily overtime because it's mandated in California, or are you going to go by the federal laws in those states that only have a 40 hour week um, requirement for overtime? So I don't necessarily have a strong recommendation as much as we would look at it on a case by case basis, depending on how what's the offset between what's gonna cost you and what's the administrative burden to actually remember all of these different laws. You do though need to play by the laws of those states, right? So usually California is a higher standard, but I know of exceptions. Like I think New Jersey has a five day sick pay requirement where ours is three. So you would wanna make sure that uh, you're always complying with the laws in that state, whether you try to keep the handbook all the same or write them separately. I've done it both ways before. Marla, you want to weigh in on that? Yeah, I agree with you again. <laughs> and and I'm laughing because you made it sound like we don't agree, but most of the time we do. No, we do. Um, <laughs> I know I, I agree wholeheartedly, and, and a lot of times it, it's a matter of taking a look at what what are we talking about number of employees. If your base is here in California, most of your employees are here, and you have onesies, twosies in the other states, you, you have to comply with those other states. But to the extent that it's less 
obligation than it is in California, we always write in the handbook that those states' laws will apply um, where it's different. Um, it, and then you just have to pull out and know what those are for internal uses. But right. if you have many employees in different states, then you might want to have a separate handbook and you might want to have separate legal counsel in that state look at it. And then to Linda's point, again, it's, you know, cost and um, yeah. other. Yeah, and whoever asked that question, I, you know, I'm happy to share with you the paragraph we put in the front of our handbook, um, you know, that, that sort of addresses that. If you want to try to keep it all within the same handbook, just email me, and I'm happy to share that paragraph with you. But it basically just says what Marla said, which is, you know, uh, the, the handbook's written for the laws of the state of California, that if you work in another state, the laws of your state are going to apply. And then when it comes to the sections like on overtime, um, we don't go into great detail. We basically refer back to the state where we know that there's going to be a difference, right? Because um, some company policies are going to be the same across the board, like you know maybe a sick pay or a vacation accrual or something like that. Where we know that there's differences, we try to keep it um, less detailed, I guess, and just say, you know, you know, see your manager, or HR, or whatever, for the laws um, in your state that apply. Perfect. Okay, and Kelly, feel free to email Linda and follow up on her kind offer. That wraps it up for us today with questions. On behalf of Linda Duffy with Ethos Human Capital Solutions and Marla Mara Robinson with Mara Robinson, Jackson, and Clarkson, I'd like to thank all of you for joining us today. Again, Linda and Marla's emails are up here. You can feel free to follow up with them. And Linda, I'm hoping you can kind of introduce our next webinar. Yeah, and um, I'm really excited. For those of you that have been on our webinars for the last few years, um, Lawrence Hartley has presented before. He's a great speaker. Um, he's president of Oak Ridge Advisors. He is a benefits expert. He goes back and lobbies Congress each year trying to make changes to um, ACA and just in general um, to benefit laws. Uh, so he is going to be here on April 21st. We've put the link to register there. Um, and he is going to be just giving us sort of a status update. He, he's really good about breaking it out also to say if you have fewer than 50 employees, this is what you need to know about what's going on in the benefits world. And if you have more than 50, here's what you need to know. So um, hopefully there's something for everybody there, and we hope that you will join us. Great. Thank you so much, everybody. We look forward to providing you with more useful information in the future. And have a wonderful rest of your day.